especially during your your lunch hour. Um, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Paul Gordon. I'm policy and public affairs manager um, at the advocacy team of the Irish Cancer Society, and my colleague Emma Hart, our, our policy officer, has kindly facilitated this uh, today. And um, so we're very excited about this this session today, um, and I hope we can have a, a good discussion about fertility preservation of cancer patients informed by experts in the area, both from cancer survivors with expertise by experience and from clinicians specializing in oncology and fertility. Um, we know that more and more people in the general population are being diagnosed with cancer, and the same is true for people at a younger age as well. Um, in 2015, uh, 698 males under the age of 44 were diagnosed with an invasive cancer compared to 570 in 2005, um, and 1,190 females were diagnosed with cancer compared to 955 in 2005. Thankfully though, survivorship was also rising. Uh, more than four in five children now survive their cancer diagnosis, and it is known that having the ability to start their own family is incredibly important um, to people in, in child, to childhood and adolescent cancer survivors in later life. The same is true also of older as adolescents and younger adults. We know in Ireland that survivorship for for females aged 15 to 44 after five years is 85% uh, and in males is 79%. Um, and access to and information about fertility options is an important part of survivorship. So while we don't have uh, comparable figures for Ireland, uh, the NICE Institute, or the, sorry, the, the, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellent, uh, Excellence, NICE, in the UK, uh, suggests that roughly 15% of people being treated for cancer will eventually have fertility problems. What we do know is that there are significant gaps in information on fertility preservation for cancer patients. While we have rough estimates and anecdotal evidence of the number of adult cancer patients who avail of um, fertility preservation publicly, we don't have hard data to tell us how many cancer patients are actually availing of services, both publicly and privately. Nor do we have figures for people who are counselled uh, on fertility, uh, but ultimately decided not to preserve their fertility. The Irish Cancer Society frequently hears of the challenges patients and survivors face around uh, fertility preservation, be it in accessing it, uh, feeling informed, um, and we also see the challenges that clinicians experience, both in educating themselves and patients in an area that has been to date underdeveloped in Ireland. Uh, this is, that's a large part of the reason we're here today, and we'd like to foster an inclusive and open discussion on the topic of fertility preservation so we can learn from people with a range of experiences and work together into the future to support stronger services and supports. To provide some background, uh, we at the Irish Cancer Society have worked in recent years to better understand the supports available to cancer patients and survivors. We've attempted to influence um, legislation in the area of assisted human reproduction to make sure that it does recognize the unique and specific challenges uh, that cancer patients and survivors face, particularly those uh, survivors of childhood cancer and adolescent cancers. Um, and we've also worked uh, at the beginning of this pandemic uh, with our colleagues in the clinical community um, to, to push the, end, the National Cancer Control Programme and the HSE to ensure that fertility preservation remained available to cancer patients before their treatment uh, so those people could, could, avoid, could avoid very difficult choices between delaying their treatment or foregoing their preservation. And thank, thankfully, we were successful in those efforts, um, along with uh, thanks to our, our colleagues in the clinical community. We've also recently um, launched research uh, with the Marion Fertility Clinic um, on childhood, uh, fertility, uh, childhood cancer fertility preservation, um, which will develop uh, specific supports and services in that area in the coming years. And we'll hear, we'll hear a little bit more about that later today. Uh, more recently, and uh, something that I suppose has instigated this discussion today, uh, we released a policy paper uh, written by Emma, Emma Hart, my colleague, who's kindly uh, facilitated the discussion to take stock of the existing policies and practices which relate to fertility preservation of cancer patients. Uh, and this paper concluded that while accredited clinics self-regulate and work in line with international best practice, there aren't any specific national protocols or guidelines for discussing or counseling on fertility preservation. Um, although these conversations do, do take place in some cases, it's not clear that there is a uniform process. Uh, fertility preservation and treatment is evolving as such, now is a, an opportune time to consider all angles in Ireland. Um, for example, who is impacted, how to support children, adolescents and young adults, what decisions are appropriate for different people uh, at different stages in their lives, and how uh, assisted human reproduction legislation uh, can support fertility preservation and more long-term storage of sperm, egg or embryo samples, particularly for people who are not yet ready to start a family. 
and current, additionally, current understanding and, and lessons from oncofertility and preservation can lead us to some simple action-oriented solutions, such as helping doctors to grow the skills and knowledge around fertility and preservation, as well as ensuring that people diagnosed with cancer are informed of their options. Finally, given this is European Fertility Week, uh, we thought this was an ideal time to engage with uh, experts in a public forum uh, to understand in more detail what the current situation is for fertility preservation and where we need to move to in the future. Uh, so we'll move on now to the panel part of our discussion. We have five excellent speakers today, um, and that will be followed by a Q&A session at the end. Uh, each of our experts is either uh, an expert by lived experience or through their uh, fertility or oncology expertise. Um, each of them will, will speak for around seven minutes um, and then we'll move on to the Q&A. So first up, we have Karen Sheehan. Uh, Karen is a cancer survivor. Ten years ago, uh, she was diagnosed with cervical cancer at the age of 23. Uh, Karen is an advocacy champion for the Irish Cancer Society uh, in the Clare constituency and is working very hard to ensure the needs of those affected by cancer are met. Uh, she's very passionate about helping others and having been through cancer herself, knows some of the short and long-term impacts um, that cancer brings. She feels especially strongly about pro providing uh, and improving mental health services and fertility services for those affected by cancer. Uh, so much so that Karen is now studying a master's in counselling and psychotherapy with the hope of working with people affected by cancer in the future. So uh, I'd just like to hand over to Karen uh, to open our panel with her story. Hi everybody. Um, so I just want to thank um, the Irish Cancer Society so much for the opportunity to speak today and to join these great panellists for what should be a very positive and informative webinar. I'm excited about hearing from the other panellists too. Um, so my story um, started in 2010. I didn't go to college until I was in my 20s. And like most in my age group, I was interested in celebrities and reality TV and as such. So when I heard that Jade Goody passed away from cervical cancer, I started to think that maybe this is what I had based on my symptoms. The awareness that she brought to cervical cancer at the time was absolutely fantastic. When I was 23 in my third year of college, I was diagnosed with stage 1B2 cervical cancer. My treatment for this was to have a hysterectomy. As I was just 23, my surgeon explored other surgery and treatment options, but unfortunately, this was the only and best option that would hopefully get rid of the cancer. When I was told I was having a hysterectomy, one of my queries was if I was, would ever be able to have my own biological kids. I was told that I could do surrogacy as I would still have my ovaries, so I didn't think too much about it in the year or two after the surgery. I focused on my recovery from the surgery and also beating cancer. When I was at one of my cancer checkups about two years later, I shared my concerns over my fertility and that I felt unsettled not knowing what lay ahead of me. My surgeon referred me to see a fertility expert in Ireland. This was an unpleasant experience for me. I attended with my mother and I was essentially told to come back in the future when I was thinking about having kids and when I had a serious partner. I was also told that I would probably need to start saving there and then at 25, as it was a very expensive process. This was a very worrying and uncertain time for me. I felt let down by the health system because there was a complete lack of communication on my own fertility. I thought, what right do these doctors have not letting me know what I could do with my body in the future? And how would I know what to say to my future partners when I didn't even know if it was possible myself to have children? In the following years, I tried not to dwell on it too much as I wasn't in a very serious relationship. And to be honest, I was a very young adult going through the whole diagnosis and recovery of cancer. It really didn't hit home until three to four years ago when I was part of the cervical check review and everything was dredged up again for me. By then, I was in a serious relationship for about three years and marriage and kids would come up in conversation frequently. He has always been so understanding but I did seek my own support for my mental health as I was struggling and I did feel a lot of guilt. We researched lots and looked into all options on how we could go about having a baby and none of it seemed quite feasible without a lot of money. I was 30 then and even with all the costs associated, there are still no guarantees with overseas adoption or surrogacy that we would even have a baby. Over time and a lot of research, we came to terms with the fact that we wouldn't have kids. 
my partner, he was very good and he was genuinely okay with that too. I attended the Cancer Survivorship Conference last year, where I had one-to-one -one time with a fertility expert based in Galway. I asked a lot about surrogacy and he explained the whole, whole process on how egg retrieval would actually be extremely, difficult, extremely hard in my case and might not even be feasible to do surrogacy, even if this was something that I wanted to explore. Notwithstanding the fact that it's not yet done in Ireland, and there are a lot of problems around the legalities with surrogacy in Ireland too. He also explained that over the last number of years, there has been a fund in place whereby cancer patients, egg, sperm or embryo, embryos could have been frozen before treatment to help with issues that may arise in the future. But he also admitted, that this has not been made common knowledge amongst consultants. He also said that this would have had to have taken place before the treatment itself. This would have broken me only for the fact that we had come to terms with not having kids already. We have realized now that not having kids is okay and that we will still have an amazing life together, but this is something I feel so passionate about and it's part of the reason I applied to become the advocacy champion in the Clare region. So I suppose what I would like to see happen in the next couple of years would be communication, communication, and even more communication. I think communication to the patient on their fertility issues for the future is just so, so important. I think a separate consultation outside what you have with your oncology doctor to discuss fertility preservation is vital. I understand a doctor being primarily concerned with get, getting rid of the cancer, but a holistic view on treatment is so important for the emotional and mental well-being of patients. Cancer patients sometimes have to suffer lifelong effects from cancer and treatment, fertility being one of these. Again, a communicated structure in place for patients undergoing cancer treatment or surgery that may affect fertility, such as egg, sperm or embryo freezing and storage free of charge. I have been made aware this week that this is available in the Rotunda in Dublin but I wasn't previously aware of this. And that's saying something as fertility would have been obviously an issue for me after my surgery. Again, to make sure that all consult consultants are aware of this and to make sure that all patients of a certain age and certain circumstances are also made aware of this and given the choice to do so. So again, communication is key. I think there should be plans put in place for those diagnosed with cancer to help protect their fertility or at least a step-by-step -step plan of what they can do in the future to try to have kids if they choose to do so. This doesn't have to be straight after the diagnosis, but to make sure that any preventative measures are put in place, such as sperm, egg or embryo freezing, but also to arrange a meeting at a later date so that these patients know what their op options are for the future, whether they're ready to start a family or not. The options should be there for them to know what their future could potentially hold. In Canada, for example, they're way ahead of us as they usually are. Onco fertility is a very detailed and cancer patient is very detailed and cancer patients, depending on their situation, are offered the opportunity to explore their fertility options further with a reproductive endocrinologist, which is, some, which is a doctor who specializes in fertility and reproduction. This is communicated to them after their diagnosis. And finally, new clear laws need to be explored in Ireland around surrogacy. Um, for example, like they would have in Prague and other European countries. A lot of cancer patients may go through the whole process of fertility preservation, but if they can't carry their own baby and also can't do surrogacy legally, there may be little point in this. I understand that this is a separate issue, but it's definitely one worth mentioning as it fits in nicely in here. Um, so again, I'd just like to thank you very much for listening and I appreciate the time. Thanks so much, Karen, for, for sharing your story there and, and also for, for those, um, those detailed recommendations, which I'm sure um, people have a, a lot of questions on. I think it's clear um, from what you say that communication is absolutely vital at, at as early a stage as possible and there, there are huge challenges uh, as well in areas um, such as the financial the financial difficulties and, and options aren't always available for, for everybody. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I'm just going to, to hand over next to Dr. Renato Bowman. Uh, Dr. Bowman is a clinical director uh, at uh, the clinical director of the Rotunda IVF since 2017 
Uh, Dr. Bowman has an a distinguished career in gynecology and obstetrics uh, and is a specialist in fertility and assisted human reproduction. Uh, he's a subspecialist in IVF uh, and before joining uh, the Rotunda IVF, he was an expert leader in the Human Reproduction Clinic in Sveti Zoo Hospital in Croatia. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Dr. Bowman. Uh, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> thank you all for being here. And, and thank you, Karen, very much for a very nice, very nice speech. So it's, it's, really, it's really moving and touching. And, 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 and I will comment uh, basically immediately few, few, in, in few words what you, what, what you mentioned. Uh, so I came from Croatia, I started fertility basically more than 20 years ago. I came in Ireland here uh, five years ago in 2015, and I was very excited that the Rotunda IVF uh, clinic was already uh, uh, treating uh, patients, uh, uh, that's okay, cancer patients before, before starting their, their, their treatment. So that's something that was new to me, but I was really, really interested in. I went and see a few conferences, and I... Mm, basically know what we have what we are offering and what is still missing and 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 i'm very glad for this for this for this uh, webinar that that we are having at the moment so uh, what and that that applies to 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 karen's to to karen's speech uh, i notice and i'm basically fascinated how in the next uh, not how in the last few years what I see, and that probably Professor Simus will, will, will say say similar thing. I see a lot of a lot of patients who are uh, visited by us. So before starting their 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 oncology treatment, they are visited by by fertility professionals, and we are discussing the the uh, options of oncofertility. So uh, basically, the clinic started uh, the oncofertility uh, in 1998. When there was uh, the the first uh, sperm freeze, so we started first of so more than 20 years ago with with freezing sperm. Then in 2002 uh, uh, we started with uh, freezing embryos. Uh, in 2014 we started uh, we introduced the process of vitrification. So this is a different uh, freezing technique that uh, allowed uh, eggs to be frozen with a better chance so before before 2014 the eggs were frozen with the slow freezing technique and that was not good technique still it's not good technique for 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 freezing eggs because the survival of eggs was was very poor so so with this new technique that it was introduced in our clinic 2014 we have a definitely a better better chance and with this vitrification, uh, the whole story generally started to move in, in the world because the, the freezing eggs become, become more, uh, more successful. Uh, in 2017, uh, we changed, until 2017, we were generally, uh, when speaking embryos, we were freezing embryos, day two embryos. So what is the story of embryos? Uh, embryos, of course, have a, have a, have a certain development. Today, so we moved in 2017 to freeze day five embryos or blastocysts. Uh, why we, we change that? Because we noticed that in some people who are going ahead through treatment, there, there was a good number of these day two embryos that were not surviving. So for example, a patient had, I don't know, 10 day two, em two, two embryos and we ended with having just one or two good day five embryos. So the chance for a good pregnancy is uh, dramatically better if you have a day five embryo frozen. There is a moment, of course, that is, that is important, and that can be also a topic for discussion. Actually, what are we freezing? Are we freezing something that is realistic, or are we freezing a hope? So with the concept of, of uh, being fair and honest, we moved to freezing something that is very serious. So, and when we changed to, to this day, day, day five, uh, the patients that are coming through to in order to get pregnant the results are really really dramatically better compared to the to the to, to the previous story uh, now what we miss in ireland uh, it is it is the ovarian tissue cryopreservation and i'm extremely happy that that colleagues from marion clinic are, are starting that and i do think that they will have they will have nice success and uh, because that is something that is not just related maybe to pediatric patients, so, so to, but also to, to, to every patient who needs 
uh, urgent fertility preservation. Every fertility preservation is urgent, don't get me wrong, but uh, in freezing eggs and embryos, then that's something that, that, uh, that our clinic is offering. Uh, we need some time, so we need two, at least two, it's usually up to three weeks for hormonal stimulation of the ovaries in order to have those eggs uh, uh, collected. And some uh, cancer patients do not have that time. So option of this ovarian cryo uh, uh, preservation of ovarian tissue crowd preservation could be a potential benefit for 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 those uh, for those uh, uh, patients. Uh, now, uh, Paul also mentioned the legislation. I think that that is extremely important because uh, we don't have the legislation still. Legislation have to have to cover uh, uh, moments like surrogacy, have to cover moments like age. What about the age? You understand? Until when we are going to freeze freeze embryos, we have we have recently a patient, a male patient for a sperm freeze who was 64. Is that ethical to freeze the sperm? Is it non-ethical not to freeze the sperm? So there are a lot of a lot of uh, controversies there that that uh, good legislation will will definitely cover and uh, will be will be in a, in a better opposition both the clinicians and both both the the the, the, the patients uh, yes that was that was uh, something that I, I wanted wanted to mention I want to mention also that uh, just that this is the panel and that that is important so the uh, rotunda IVF clinic uh, started uh, as a part of the rotunda hospital uh, and the name, the name was Hari. It was Human Assisted Reproduction Ireland. In 2014, the clinic uh, changed ownership, and now the Virtus Australia, so they're a big IVF uh, brand, uh, is is a owner of our clinic. The Rotunda IVF is moving next uh, in next two months in mid December is moving to uh, a new facility. That's going to be nicer, bigger, and so on uh, in sorts. And uh, we will continue our, our service, but we'll have some limitations. And until we have some, some mm, conversation uh, with, with the HSC, we'll definitely continue to giving the, 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 the same service. Just definitely we'll have some problems with patients who need uh, hospital support. So uh, at the moment there is there is a, there was a discussion and conversation with Marion Fertility Clinic and and they will they will they are happy to to take uh, those uh, those patients and and take the uh, good care of them. Uh, the, what to uh, what to uh, uh, add? Maybe maybe to add just I'm not sure are you going to see things that I'm going to present. So this is our uh, contact. Uh, at the moment, so so the email of our of our uh, coordinator, oncology coordinator, and uh, and the number, and then what else I wanted just to share with you, uh, just to share with you some some thoughts that uh, even uh, onco fertility is definitely very very important, but the decision uh, uh, of that is at the end in the, in the hands of the oncologist because uh, because uh, health is uh, first and the second thing that i want to say, that i want to want to mention is that uh, the chance with eggs and the chance with embryos is a chance it's a good chance is a realistic chance but still a chance and uh, when when speaking about the chance i would i also found one of the articles that I would recommend really as one of the best, from my opinion, that, that people, even patients, even professionals, can have a good uh, idea of, of, of uh, uh, chances with, with frozen uh, eggs or, or embryos in the future. So this is a work from, from Ana Cobo. They are from Spain, but it's a really uh, an article with, with high number of, of, of uh, patients treated. Uh, maybe just to conclude, 
uh, one of the, I really recommend it to everybody to, 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 to read it, to, to have some uh, more information about it, but age of the patient is crucial. So, so generally, uh, in, in, their, in, their, in their group, some 75 to 80 percent of ladies who had their fertility preservation done before they are 35 had success and have babies. After age of 35, that, uh, that dramatically changes and the drop is, is uh, su substantial. So uh, I would, I would uh, finish with, uh, with uh, this uh, story and I will, and I will uh, leave uh, my colleagues to, to, to continue. And I will be here, of course, for additional, additional uh, questions. Just have to stop sharing this. Thank you, Thank very, you. very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Bowman. Some, some really interesting points there, both about the, the history um, at the Rotunda um, improvements, uh, technological improvements made in, in recent years, the, the ethical challenges um, associated with, with fertility preservation, and I suppose the need, um, in some cases, to to communicate, uh, I suppose, with with a, with realism, um, the the chances associated with with preservation, and we'll be sure um, to share those contact details in that article with, with anyone uh, who's on the call afterwards. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I, I will just go next to uh, Professor Seamus O'Reilly. Uh, Professor O'Reilly is a consultant medical oncologist since two thousand and one. He's currently co-national director in medical oncology at the Royal College of Physicians and professor at University College Cork. He's uh, established medical oncology programs in, in Waterford University Hospital and Cork University Hospital, uh, a cancer clinical trials unit in Waterford and a clinical trials unit in Cork uh, funded by the HRB. Uh, professor Riley will take a position of vice clinical lead for Cancer Trials Ireland in January 2021 and I'm sure we look forward to working with him in that, uh, in, in that role. Um, so thank you very much for joining uh, Professor O'Reilly and I'll, I'll just hand over to you. So thank you both, uh, uh, you and Emma, for organising this uh, uh, seminar. So um, oncofertility is very important uh, and it's becoming increasingly important as uh, people start families later in our, in our, in our community uh, and as, I think as, as we become, become more aware of the impact of, 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 of treatment-related infertility uh, on, on patients who are cancer survivors. Um, there's a great article series at the moment in the in the Sunday Times magazine by uh, Sophie Bessinger. I hope I'm saying the name right. But in it, in her first article, she said that uh, chemotherapy in your thirties is a speed bump, and uh, infertility is a is a mountain on a motorway. And um, and I think that really reflects a, a lot of what our patients go through when they've you know moved beyond cancer, and they're moving back to life as normal. Um, we would also find that when we're meeting them and discussing uh, cancer treatments uh, and the potential fertility effects of, the, of that, that that can be uh, more distressing to them than the cancer diagnosis. Um, so I, 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 um, in terms of where this area is, they, they, when we see people with cancer for the, uh, where we're concerned, where they haven't completed their family or haven't started their family, and we're concerned that our treatment is going to affect uh, fertility, then we start a discussion with them. And it, it divides into two paths. Um, uh, there's uh, where tissue is harvested, such as uh, M sperm uh, uh, banking, uh, or referral to the, which is done in the Harry unit in our case, or, or where you're looking at ovarian uh, uh, egg harvesting and, uh, and potentially embryo freezing uh, as well. Um, so obviously when you're seeing patients in this setting, the concern is, will the, will, is it safe to do this? Is, it, is there a delay in starting cancer treatment, which is curative in, 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 a, in a patient before this can occur? And, and then the other thing is that the majority of people that I would refer for, uh, for, for oncofertility assessment of breast cancer, and that's a hormone driven disease. Uh, and is it safe to be giving drugs that stimulate fertility and increase estrogen levels in, in, in patients? Does that, will that, reduce their outcome or affect their cancer related outcome um, so the so we the the treating doctors need a roadmap and and the roadmap is the european society of medical oncology guidelines and they're updated every few years they've most recently been updated they're really clear they're uh, they're uh, available free online uh, and so they're easily accessible in our clinics for instance 
Um, and uh, for men, the pathway is, uh, is very reassuring and, and straightforward in terms of uh, sperm banking and, and, and assessment. And, and then for women, it would involve um, egg harvesting. And, and they, most importantly, they provide very reassuring data that giving fertility, uh, fertility promoting drugs in patients with the history of breast cancer is safe. And, and this is important information, reassuring for, for everybody, the patient and, and for the treating doctors. Um, uh, th these guidelines are kind of are, are foundation of care um, uh, because they're evidence-based, they're evidence written by uh, leading, um, leading experts. Um, for patients where that's not feasible, and, uh, and uh, I'll discuss the gaps in treatment later on, um, we look at a drug called Zolidex, which is a hormone drug to hibernate the ovaries during treatment to reduce the risk of chemotherapy-induced uh, 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 chemotherapy damage to the ovaries. Um, and those drugs are started before treatment starts. Uh, those drugs don't work in men. Um, the, I've been involved as a medical oncologist for, um, for 20 years, and uh, it's been great to see that the services, particularly for women, develop in that time period. Um, sperm banking has always been available for men, but there's a huge, there's a significant gap in, in two areas. One is female uh, fertility preservation and alcohol fertility. And the second one is, is, is fertility preservation for, for uh, pre-pubertal and, and uh, ages and children's age groups. I don't treat those patients, uh, but, I, but I, I would recognize that it's a significant uh, issue. Uh, the, the other gaps that I would see are, are costs. So there's a, a grant to, for, to allow people to harvest tissue and to have it stored but the, but but once the thing once it needs to be used then there isn't a grant uh, and this is a, 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 a I think will be an equity of access issue that that I would see my patients tell me that many of these treatments are are very expensive uh, and I think there's a lack of awareness in the medical oncology and cancer treatment community that the service is free just to to, to uh, acquire you know for for harvesting beforehand but when the patient and their and their uh, family want to use it subsequently, then there's there, then there's an, an issue. Um, I think the other the other gaps that I would see would be that the technology is moving ahead of the law. Uh, so issues like surrogacy, my patients are traveling to uh, Canada, uh, England, um, and Spain for uh, to consider surrogacy, um, and we have enormous gaps in in our we have no, we we have no. The gaps in legislation here are, are significant. Um, the other gap that I find is, is, thing, is, is adoption, um, that many of my patients want to look at ado adoption. Uh, and the, 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 in many of the cancers we treat, if, if a cancer is, has been in remission for five years, it's viewed as cured. But in some of the adoption papers that, that I've, I've seen and I've been looked at, the five years starts from when their five years for the adoption agency starts from five years after that five years. So it's 10 years, which in, in a young person's life or when they're trying to start and, and rear a family is, is significant and doesn't seem logical to me, to be honest with you. Um, uh, uh, finally, I, I think that, the, that in, in this area, uh, I've learned that in terms of learning what's going, happening and, and, and uh, and, and being engaged with the area, that the patient is the greatest teacher in this area. I've learned more in terms of what technologies are available, what, 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 are, the, uh, what are, the, are the speed bumps and what are the bigger bumps on the road, uh, uh, and what are the potholes on the road for patients from, from listening to patients. And we did a, 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 an education session last year. It's combined with the obstetricians and the medical oncologists. And the, so that for the initial part of that, uh, we had a patient testimony uh, by video link from Canada and uh, discussing her experience with being a, a patient in, in, in the oncology service, the voices that she heard that she felt were, uh, uh, were insensitive, the voices that she heard that, that she thought listened to her, uh, the voice, the, 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 the message that our, that our trainees needed to hear in terms of interacting, interacting with patients. Um, Karen has spoken a lot about having, you know, a, a, a fertility, a separate fertility uh, uh, assessments uh, uh, and, and, and that. But I think that it may be that integrating things in early on to say, what are the fertility issues? What are the, going to be the fertility aspects uh, or fertility uh, threatening aspects of what we do on this patient's uh, care plan? 
and how do we address it uh, early on with, at, their, at our multidisciplinary meetings. And certainly we've started to do that now for our breast cancer patients where they, at the breast multidisciplinary meetings or at the gynae meetings to say what are, the what are the oncofertility aspects of care that are going to be affected by, by what's planned for the next six months and let's get active on, on, on orchestrating uh, uh, referrals, et cetera, and dialogue uh, uh, at this time. So I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll end, end there, and I'm happy to take questions later on. And I just want, want to reiterate my thanks to the Irish Cancer Society for this initiative and for, for also for the initiative with, for, uh, for younger patients, which I think has been an enormous gap in, our, in, our, in, 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 in cancer care in our communities here. Thank, thank you so much, Professor O'Reilly. It's really, really um, insightful um, presentation there, particularly um, some, some areas that have, I suppose, have already been, been, been identified by Karen around, around legislation um, and the need for us to, I suppose, catch up with how uh, issues are, are, are moving. And that's certainly something that um, we're keen to see, see progressed and, and colleagues of ours in, in the 221 Plus group have, have uh, certainly advocated on strongly and the need for, for people to, to uh, and for the, the importance of, of advocates and self-advocates um, in the area of fertility. Um, so that's, that's really interesting stuff. So thank you very much. Um, and I, I'll move on next to uh, Dr. Maeve Horan. Uh, so Dr. Horan is a specialist registrar in obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, she's currently completing a clinical fel fellowship and doctorate in medicine in fertility and reproductive uh, medicine at University College Dublin. Dr. Horner's doctorate is focused on developing fertility preservation services for children and young people with cancer and establishing national guidelines for patients and healthcare providers to identify young people most at risk of fertility loss after cancer treatment. Uh, so Dr. Horan, um, I'd be really grateful if you could if you could hop on there. Thank you very much. Um, hi, so my name is Maeve Horan. I'm one of the uh, doctors in the Marion Fertility Clinic. So thank you, Paul, and thank you to the Irish Cancer Society for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk at this webinar today about a really important project that's currently underway in the Marion Fertility Clinic, and that is the Childhood Cancer Fertility Project, which is in collabor collaboration with the Irish Cancer Society, CHI Crumlin, and the NCCP. So in terms of background to this project, so every year in Ireland, um, around 200 uh, children receive a new diagnosis of cancer. And we know that there are specific treatments, um, such as some chemotherapies and radiation uh, therapy, that can have lifelong uh, negative effects on their fertility. We also know um, from lots of studies and from Karen's uh, talk that um, loss of fertility is a real concern to survivors of cancer. And we also know that as treatments improve and survivorship improves and survival rates improved, as, as Paul mentioned, that the emphasis shifts to uh, quality of life and what we're hoping to provide with this childhood cancer fertility project is a way of helping survivors um, of cancer to have the opportunity of having their own um, family in the future. So prior to this project there was no structured referral system um, for fertility preservation in Ireland for adolescents and uh, post-pubertal um, patients. So although egg and uh, sperm freezing are an established method of fertility preservation for this cohort of child and adolescent patients in the Europe and the UK. This service was not available in Ireland. So this meant that a referral pathway wasn't in place for oncologists or GPs who have patients who've either had, had cancer treatment as a child um, and now want to be assessed or patients who are about to undergo um, cancer treatment. And another important element that wasn't available um, was funding for this service. So if patients or parents decided to consider or explore the option of fertility preservation, that often meant considering traveling abroad and they had to incur the costs of this themselves. So what have we done? So uh, in conjunction with the Irish Cancer Society, they have funded a three-year program for fertility preservation for children and adolescents and young adults um, to explore this option. So we have three main cohorts who we are offering treatment to at the moment. So first of all, our young male patients. So as um, Professor Riley mentioned that sperm freezing has been around for quite a while and there's not as much of a lead in to sperm freezing. So the male patients won't need a pre-treatment and um, it can be done at very short notice. Um, and they may need one or two appointments to, um, to achieve this. Um, our second cohort of patients then are our young girls pre-treatment, so post-pubertal girls who are about to undergo 
cancer treatment. So they can now be referred to us if their oncologist deems that their treatment is potentially high risk to their fertility. And if their oncologist also deems that it is reasonable to delay starting their treatment by up to a period of two weeks. So if we are going to provide egg freezing for them, we will need this two week period for the stimulation for the egg harvesting. And then usually, typically they can start into their chemotherapy almost straight away after the egg collection process. Our third cohort of patients then is our survivors. So our uh, adolescent and young adult survivors, so male or female patients. Looking specifically at our female patients, um, so a pilot study was performed in the Marion Fertility Clinic and patients contacted um, through, uh, through Crumlin Hospital. And this was done between, in the last year or two. And within a week, 85% of the patients that were reached out to to offer them a fertility assessment responded and say that, said that they were something that they were interested in. So the uptake from this cohort of patients has been excellent and the feedback so far has been really positive. So what we're offering for these patients is essentially a fertility assessment, which involves a consultation with a doctor, um, an ultrasound scan to look at ovarian reserve, so egg numbers, and a blood test as well. So what we're hoping is that the majority of these patients will have reassuring um, results and we are going to continue to follow them up yearly. And if they have lower egg, egg numbers, then we'd counsel them about potentially freezing eggs to help preserve this, their fertility into the future. So um, it's a new project, but already the feedback has been excellent and it's been something that's been really great to be involved in. So the funding as it stands is for the next three years. And what we want to do over the next three years is streamline the service, make it even more accessible for patients, GPs, oncologists to refer. Um, currently, it is Irish Cancer Society funded and we want to ensure the continuation of this project into the future through, through the HSE. And so our aim at the moment is to secure state funding once this, once this project is up and running. And our overarching aim is just to finish on is that we want to make sure that our child and adolescent patients, our children and adolescent patients in Ireland have the same standard of care uh, as their peers in the UK and in Europe um, for fertility preservation. So thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Dr. Horan. Uh, that's really exciting stuff to hear. Um, uh, and I suppose one of the commitments the Irish Cancer Society is, is really keen to see through is that, is that patients in Ireland, be, be they adults, adolescents or children, have, have access to the best possible, the best possible care um, uh, and improvements in quality of life. So it's really interesting to hear and it's, it's great to hear that there's, so, there's such huge uptake already. So it's really exciting and we, we look forward to, uh, to continuing work with you over the coming years and hopefully ensuring that that is sustainable. Um, so next, I'll just turn to um, Geraldine Dunphy. So Geraldine is from Dublin. Uh, she works as the project manager for ESB Networks. Uh, in her spare time, Geraldine is quite active. She spends time with her family and friends, traveling, going to gigs, reading and exercising. Uh, about two years ago, Geraldine was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, and underwent surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Following her diagnosis, Geraldine mentioned that she found great comfort in reading about or hearing other stories, people with their experience. Uh, because of this, Geraldine has been sharing her story to provide some comfort and support to people who are living with cancer. Uh, and Geraldine is now going to, to close our panel session by sharing her story. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, firstly, I'd just like to thank the Irish Cancer Society for inviting me to share my experience. So I'll share my story from my perspective. And if anyone has any questions at the end, I'll try my best to answer them. So um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in September 2018. I was 37 at the time and I had no children. When I found the lump in my breast, I immediately went for tests, so I mammogram, ultrasound, biopsies. As a lot of you know, that waiting time for results, it's a horrible time. You know, you have all sorts of scenarios playing out in your mind. So for me, I decided, I decided to prepare for the worst and anything better than that was a bonus. So I went off and I researched what type of treatments were available and what the potential side effects could be. I wrote out a list of questions to ask my consultant if he told me it was cancer. I gave the list to my sister. I told her to make sure that if he tells me it's cancer and I can't keep it together, make sure you ask all the questions and get the answers. I says one of the questions on that list was about my fertility. Uh, you know, what would happen? Would I be pushed into the menopause? And, and then that was it for me. Um, as I said, I was 37 at the time and I hadn't found myself in a position to be considering having children before this. Um, you know, I was in a very new relationship at the time and, and I didn't want the option of potentially having children one day taken away from me. 
you know, I, I spoke to my breast surgeon when I went, obviously, um, after the results of my biopsy, he told me um, that it was cancer, and, but that I, and I spoke about my fertility concerns, and he told me that I could go for egg harvesting. So he opted to go for surgery first so that I had time to go to the egg harvesting process. Um, so I had my surgery and that day when the surgeon called around to the ward again I asked him you know when would I be starting the egg harvesting process and I was told to wait until the pathology, pathology results um, came back to see if I needed more surgery. I waited three weeks and got the good news that I didn't need any more surgery which was great. Um, I was told that I'd be getting chemotherapy and Herceptin. I again asked about the egg harvesting and I was told that the oncologist would discuss this with me. So over a week later, I met with the oncologist and he explained about the chemotherapy I'd be receiving and the reasons for it. I asked about my fertility and was told that it's uncertain whether my, fit, my, whether my fertility would return um, because of my age. Um, he explained that I'd be given Zolodex to try and preserve my ovaries during treatment. And I asked about the egg harvesting and he told me I was too late. He said that process would take about two months and that I should have gone through the process by now and that I needed to start chemo. Um, he explained that obviously his job as an oncologist, his priority is to try and prevent the cancer from returning, but that he did understand that people have their own priorities in life. So I left that day thinking that I had a decision to make, you know, should I delay treatment, you know, and try egg harvesting or do I just begin with treatment straight away? So I went off to try and research um, egg harvesting and the potential risks. So my cancer was hormone positive. And um, so I was afraid by going through fertility treatment that I'd be up in the estrogen levels in my body and and potentially feeding any residual cancer cells that were there, or I was worried that would delaying treatment give me time, give time for the cancer to come back. I, I was very confused. I said, so two days later, I got a call from the hospital um, telling me to come in um, the next day to give me the Zolodex injection and to give me a rundown on the different uh, drugs I'd be taking and the possible side effects. I say I was in total shock would be an understatement. I was thinking that I didn't get the I didn't get the chance to make that decision, and the decision has just been made for me. Um, I was worried that if my fertility doesn't come back, you know, what are my options? So I was crying down the phone to the nurse, explaining how I felt and what I was thinking, and and she was really she was really lovely. She spoke to the oncologist, and he arranged for a referral to the rotunda so that I could discuss my situation with the doctors there. Um, for my own self, I needed information so that I could make, um, at least make an informed decision. You know, a few days later, I went to the Rotunda and I spoke to one of the doctors there. She, she explained the whole egg retrieval process to me. I asked her about the concerns I had and she put my mind at ease with her explanations. She told me the whole process would take about three weeks and that I could start immediately. I decided I wanted to go ahead and try egg retrieval if my oncologist thought it was safe to delay my treatment. So the hospital contacted my oncologist um, and he agreed to give me the three weeks to try. So I had blood tests that day. I had blood tests taken and I had an internal scan to check my ovaries. The next day I started on a drug called letrozole and that basically boosts growth and release of eggs in women who are not ovulating. So it means that I could start the whole process straight away rather than waiting on my normal cycle. Two days after that, I started going left injections. So going the left stimulates the follicles to try and help them grow. So I, I was very worried about administering these injections to myself as I'd never had to inject myself before. So, but the nurse in the tunnel demonstrated how to do it. They gave me guides containing photos to show me how. So, you know, after I'd done the first one, I was fine. Um, it's just, it's literally just like a pen with a needle on it. It wasn't too bad. I says on day five and day eight, I was back in the rotunda then for scans and bloods to check the growth of the follicles. Um, on day eight, the team realized that I had cysts on my ovaries and that they were preventing the follicles from growing. So um, there were two follicles that had the potential to grow um, and they, I, my dosage of going left was up to try and give them an opportunity to grow. Because, and if they didn't, then I'd have to stop the process. So I went back three days later and thankfully the two follicles had grown. And two days later, um, I started with another injection, which is called cetratide. So this blocks um, the hormone that causes the eggs to be released from your ovaries. And then um, 36 hours before I was due to go in for the egg harvesting, I had to take another um, busserlin. So this allows your body to release the eggs. So I went in on day 15 for the egg retrieval um, I was sedated. So basically I fell asleep and woke up and it was all over. And they managed to recover one egg and I went home and later got a call to say that they had successfully frozen that one egg. 
you know, I was, I suppose afterwards, I was disappointed that due to my circumstances, I only retrieved one egg and I know the chances of a live birth from just one egg is very low. But I was actually really happy, you know, happy that I'd managed to come out with something after going through the whole process. And for me, it was more about trying. Um, you know, if it's not meant to be and I'm unable to have children, um, at least I know I tried everything I could to give myself that option. You know, and, you know, one thing a doctor did say to me there um, was, you know, as long as you have a womb, you have options, you know, and this brought me great comfort because um, there are other options out there, you know, options that I hadn't thought about before, you know, and I, I feel very lucky to have been given the opportunity to try and harvest eggs, you know, I've since spoken to, um, to other women in the same situation who were never given this option, you know, and the fact that it, um, there's a fund there for cancer patients to avail of this for free is, is amazing. And the whole fertility journey, um, it's a very emotional time for anybody. Um, but add to that a cancer diagnosis, it's tough. It, it's, it's really, really tough. Um, if I was asked, you know, what could make this time a bit easier, you know, based on my own experience, is that consultants were having these conversations with their patients from the very start. Um, that they consult with other doctors involved in your treatment, in, in my case, my oncologist, you know, so that the necessary arrangements can be made um, if a person decides to harvest eggs. It can be planned in and around the treatment and hopefully give patients the options uh, for life after cancer treatment. So that's um, my story. And I'd just like to finish by again, thanking the Irish Cancer Society for arranging this webinar and inviting me to be a part of it. Thank you very much, Chair, for, for coming on and sharing this story. It's, it's really interesting to hear, to hear your experience and, and the importance of having those conversations because it, I mean, it seems to me that if you hadn't, if you hadn't spoken with, with that nurse at that time, you may have missed the opportunity. Um, so I think it, it kind of goes back to the point uh, that Karen was making around at the start, that, that communication is absolutely key. Um, and that's something that I think is probably a clear, a clear theme from, from everyone who spoke today. Um, uh, be, be it Professor Riley who's suggesting this obviously should be part of a care pathway um, and Karen's recommendations. So, so thanks very much, Chair. That's, that's really great. I think we've had a wonderful discussion today. I realise we're a little bit over time. So if anyone is, is waiting and, and does want to jump off the call, please go ahead. But I, I think we're, we're having such a, an engaging discussion here. If anyone would like to stay on for, for a few more minutes than anticipated, please do so. Um, so so we'll, we'll, we'll go to, to questions. I don't have any coming through yet, but I, I think from my own perspective, as I kind of touched on, conversations around fertility preservation can really decrease that, that regret that some people have who are going through treatment for cancer. You know, we've heard from, from the panelists that communication is not always clear on preservation or, or fertility options prior to treatment. Um, and some sur surveys have, have borne that out and shown that awareness isn't always high among healthcare professionals. Um, so that's something that, that, that really needs to be addressed. Um, it would seem to me that there's a lot of challenges, I suppose, in, in the legislative area and the scenario that our, our team would, would work on, and um, particularly um, particularly around assisted assisted human reproduction. And, and there, there is there is legislation on that that hasn't really progressed uh, through the uh, through the Dáil and the Shannon as quickly um, as as we might have anticipated or liked. Um, and, and we'll certainly work with colleagues to ensure that 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 does happen and that the conversations of, of cancer patients at all ages and, and stages are, are um, considered in that. And also there's, I think it's clear that there's, there's real financial challenges for people um, and, and there's a lack of awareness around what services are out there. So, so the Rotunda does excellent work in, in providing, um, providing public, uh, publicly funded uh, preservation pre-treatment, um, but there's, I think, still confusion about what people are, are able to access. So, so there are big challenges out there. And I think, I think we all need to work as various communities, be it patients and um, representative organizations like the society um, and, and clinicians to, to come together and, and ensure that, that we're seeing off the same hymn sheet and that we're ensuring that those, those services are, are, are properly advertised and properly funded as well. Um, so I might, I, I don't have any questions. Uh, I only have, don't have any questions coming through yet, um, but I do know Emma, uh, our, our policy officer does does uh, have a question, so I, I'd just like to pop Emma on there if you'd like to join. Hi, thanks a million, uh, and thanks to each of our panelists for taking the time to prepare and present such interesting contributions. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the point of communication because that seems to be 
for me, the, the main takeaway, um, or at least the main thread that's running through each of the presentations. So I'm wondering if it would be possible to maybe talk about actually, um, you know, the level of awareness or the actual level of awareness amongst oncologists and healthcare professionals for uh, fertility preservation services. And if this is low, how could that be addressed so that nobody kind of falls through uh, without having this conversation? So are there, are there any of our panelists who'd like to, to jump on that, first of all? So what, what I do think that that uh, the meeting between, between, between colleagues who are in fertility generally and with oncologists generally would be definitely helpful you know i think that this is helping generally because because i, I hope that there are a good number of our colleagues that are on the web, uh, webinar and i think that this is raising uh, awareness of the options and about the the possibilities of it i i just have wanted to comment uh, something that i think it is important and that's something that professor uh, shimus O'Reilly mentioned and that is funding because that is unfortunately that is that is true. So uh, the preservation is funded, but the treatment is not at the moment. So that's something that I was for five years. I was speaking to patient. Look, that that to me is not logic. I hope that that will change, but it's not changing for the last five years. So you know, it's fantastic that the, the first part is funded, but as the first first part is funded, you are kind of expecting that also the treatment will be funded. That it's not at the moment. So this is something that is maybe even above this 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 uh, topic because Ireland is one of the maybe few, if not the only country in European Union where fertility treatment is not funded at all. You know, so this is also another 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 moment that is outside of this box, of course. So uh, yeah, thank you. So. Um, <clears throat> I get so from an oncology. I guess from an oncology point of view, I'm kind of disappointed about so uh, 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 about the lack of awareness among my community, uh, frankly, uh, about the timing and scheduling that Jur had mentioned and uh, and Karen had mentioned. Um, so I, we have regular education sessions for our trainees about oncofertility. Um, uh, I, I was scribbling down some notes about what to say today, but I I, I also think there's a there's an also thing called duty of care. Uh, to patients when you're giving them treatments that can that can have life-altering uh, issues that uh, reducing or abrogating those uh, uh, and having that discussion is uh, is really important. I, I, when I started working here first, I had this young guy came in and he had testicular cancer and he was very he was sick, but he wasn't that he was he was he wasn't too sick to go to the rotunda, but he, he as far as he was concerned. He, you know, he wasn't going to. You know, he, he fertility wasn't something that was going to bother him. And um, and then ten years later, he arrived in the clinic with his wife or partner uh, 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 to discuss what to do now because he had declined it completely ten years before. And so I, I think that was a, 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 a you know a small conversation previously. Now was everything to him and to his and to his family. And um, so I, I I so I guess that's the the. The first thing is the importance of it in terms of of, of long term. Um, I think education is is probably the most important thing, and, and awareness uh, uh, um, of it. I think that you know your the, your initiative for younger children, for younger patients is, is really important. Um, but I think awareness in our community about the guidelines and what they say are are, are safe, um, and and what can be achieved as well. I mean, we've rarely had. Uh, a delay of more than a week for if we refer someone to the rotunda for uh, for tr for treatment, and we're about to start on 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 the breast cancer therapy that was that was mentioned. Um, I think we've had one patient deferred by a week in in recent memory, and we would be we would refer several people several people a year for for treatment uh, uh, before chemotherapy. So I think there's a gap in the medical side, more a bigger gap than I had realised. Um, to be honest with you. Well, thanks um, both uh, Dr. Bowman and Professor O'Reilly. Those are really interesting perspectives, and it is it is positive to hear that that pathway is is clear and is 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 accessible. But obviously, um, harking back to Dr. Bowman's comments, it it, it does seem um, it, it I, I think it's probably staggering for some patients to hear that the 
the uh, fertility preservation itself is available publicly, but that there are significant costs available afterwards. And we know from, from our engagement that in, in recent years, the government had made a commitment to ensure that there was um, funding for, for people who, who would like to, um, to would like, who would like to, um, to, to uh, have IVF treatment. Um, but that has been somewhat tied, I think, to the, to the legislation which has been held up. So it, it really has been a bit of a, a, glacial, a glacial process so far in that respect. And we're certainly keen to work with our colleagues to, to progress that. I'd just like to go to, um, I think Patricia McCaulgan um, is on the line there. She has, um, she has a couple of questions. Um, if you'd like to, to hop on there, Patricia. Apologies, I wasn't expecting that. Sorry. Um, uh, really, uh, uh, thank you. Just fascinating morning. Uh, really wonderful to be here and thank you to everybody for their contributions. Um, I, I agree completely that um, while there is work going on in the background, there's a lack of knowledge from people who are approaching treatment, uh, families who are approaching treatment, and also people who've had treatment previously. Is What, what is available now and how do they access it? How can we share that information? Um, I can answer some of those, Patricia. So, um, so for the survivors, the cohort of survivors that we're seeing at the moment, that is aimed at childhood, cancers, or cancer survivors from childhood cancer, so who've had their treatment in Crumlin as a child and are now um, in the adolescent or young, young adult cohort. So between the ages 17 or 25, that's who we're seeing at the moment in the Marion Fertility Clinic. Um, it can, they can be referred through their GP or through their original oncologist if they still have contact with their oncologist, so if they haven't been discharged from their care. Ideally, we'd have a summary of care of what, what treatment they've had. So um, just looking back over the few referrals that we've had from oncologists, they might have said, made a comment whether it's potentially a high risk treatment to their fertility. And that gives us an idea um, of uh, expected ovarian reserve tests and it helps us counsel the patients. And then if it's been an anticipated high risk um, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, then it also gives us an idea of, um, of what we anticipate their ovarian reserve tests will be. Um, I saw that you, what is the, um, the pre-treatment, did you ask that as a, um, so it's post-pubertal patients that we're seeing, so it is a little bit at the discretion of the oncologist in terms of their sexual development, so um, we have had boys as young as 12 with frozen sperm in the clinic with us, which is amazing, and um, so that's obviously um, up until they're adults because then they can go to the services in the rotunda, and then girls, we're saying if they have their periods and are age 14 or over for egg freezing and I guess most of the evidence there is that is in egg freezing in post-pubertal girls and how uh, and the quality of using those eggs in the longer term obviously there are other options available as the Fertility Project is just rolling out we are just doing egg freezing at the moment but hopefully in if this does continue beyond the three-year project we'll be um we'll be developing the service further. And if uh, somebody was 17 or 18 and treated in an adult hospital um is the program open to them? Yeah, we are seeing we are seeing patients in that cohort as well. So I guess most if if that they're on the kind of verge of being um, outside of the Crumlin age range and and in the adult age age range, and again, if it's just a summary of care of the treatment that they've had, but we're happy to see them. How can we um, share this information with with the community? I guess it's events like this. We're having lots of meetings with the NCCP, as you know, in terms of how to disseminate this webinars like this. Um, I guess information for GPs because a lot of the patients now have, have finished their oncology care and are back to the care with their GPs. So it's, um, it's reaching out to those, um, to those people as well, I guess is, it's really important. Yeah, I think it would be very, very helpful to have a sort of a, a short summary of, and also the question is when, when people, obviously the program can't cover everybody. Um, so what are the options for the people that aren't covered by the program as well would be, would be great to have information on that for the public, for, for the survivors. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think there's actually a really good um, uh, information on the Irish Cancer Society website just underneath the Childhood Cancer Fertility Project and it does mention some of the age ranges and cohorts of, of, of how, and how to contact as well, which is, which is uh, a good um, information. That's great, thanks very much. Uh, do we have any 
any further further questions uh, coming in at the moment? I don't see any, but if anyone would like to, to jump in, please feel free to, to pop something in the chat box or, or raise your hand. I'll just give it a, just give it a 30 seconds, um, otherwise we might, we might just wrap up. Okay, as, we, as we've taken uh, an extra 10 minutes of everyone's time, um, I, I, will, um, I will wrap up for the afternoon. But if people would like to follow up with any questions to us, um, please, do, uh, please do email us through the address um, which you would have been contacted before or through advocacy at irishcancer.ie. I would just like to thank um, all of our speakers today. I think it's been a really wonderful discussion and, and a great starting point. Um, a great starting point for, for further discussion. Um, from, from our perspective, I think we'll be looking to undertake further, further research um, through our advocacy team along with, uh, along with support to the, to the programme that Dr, uh, Dr. Horner and colleagues are, are working on. Um, and, in, and I think we, we probably, there are probably actions for us um, to ensure that there is greater, greater information as to, to what is available and there is a need for, for more advocacy, um, both from um, both from patients themselves, but from, from our organisation to ensure that there is greater funding um, and there's greater information available about uh, fertility preservation. So I would really like to thank everyone again for joining us today. I think it's been a great discussion and uh, we hope that this uh, is just a starting point and, and this conversation can continue over a number of months and years. So thank you very much. <laughs>